If you've ever driven on the N1 through to Cape Town, um, which is a lovely long journey through the Karoo, then, then you'll definitely have passed through the small Karoo town of Lanesburg. And there's a river that flows through Lanesburg that most of the time is just a very small stream. But those of you that have been around a while will know that on the 25th of January, 1981, there was a massive cloudburst to the northeast of this little Karoo town. And hydrologists estimate that it was of such a magnitude and so rare that such a cloudburst would probably only happen once every 100 years. And so since it doesn't often rain in the area, uh, obviously the water just runs off the soil because the soil is, just doesn't have the capacity to, to absorb the water very quickly and it just goes into the, the local rivers. And in 1981, within just a few minutes, a six meter high wall of water swept through the town of Lanesburg. In fact, it swept it away. It destroyed 184 houses and left only 21 houses standing. 104 people from that town died and it's such a small community that must have rocked them. In fact, the bodies of 72 of those people that have died have never ever been recovered or found. The force of the water was so strong that I'm told that dead bodies were found all the way in Mossel Bay. That is 250 kilometers away. 10 survivors were unable to resist the force of the water and they were rescued 21 kilometers away at a local dam, the Flores Coral Dam. That's incredible to, to survive that and to be washed for 21 k's. And every time I travel through Lanesburg, I'm just kind of harrowed as I, uh, as I relive the story. And if you've been there, take some time to walk around the town and you'll see various markings of, of where those flood uh, levels reached. And it's just incredible because sometimes you look at that river, it's completely dry. It's just a, a bunch of stones and a dry riverbed. And you think, how on earth in just a few minutes did this massive uh, wall of water do so much damage? And then I think of a parable that Jesus told. A parable also about a flash flood, about two men who built two houses in two different locations on two different foundations with two different outcomes. And the one probably built in a wadi, which we looked at when we looked at Psalm 23 as we walked through the valley of the shadow of death, probably maybe close to a dry riverbed. And we know in the nation of Israel, there's also flash floods. But the other built on a solid rock. His house stood firm and the other one was utterly destroyed when that flash flood came through. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. It's on page 7 of your New Testament. Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24. And it's interesting, this is a parable that is recorded by both Matthew and Luke. It's called the parable of the wise and foolish builders, or I like to call it the parable of the two builders. And this parable comes as the grand finale, the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. So this is the longest recorded sermon we have of Christ. He preaches from Matthew chapter 5 through to Matthew chapter 7. If I have the privilege of preaching next year, I think this would be a wonderful sermon for us to unpack, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's Jesus' first parable. So we, we, if you were the listeners, you would have never heard a parable from your Lord's mouth up until this point, and this is the first parable recorded, and I've chosen to leave it as the last parable in our series called Parable Stories That Read Us. So let's read it together, and it's, it's going to challenge us as, as if the others haven't. All these parables have challenged us deeply. So let's look at Matthew 7 from verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, this isn't a parable about construction principles. It's primarily a parable about spiritual building. It's about where you are building your life this morning. And I think what makes this parable really challenging is that everything looks identical. These two houses look identical until the storm hits. And so I want us to unpack what are some of the similarities. So number one, both builders are building a house. Both of them are busy 
Both are investing time and money and energy, and if you've ever done any building projects, you know how stressful that can be, and they've managed their stress, they've persevered, they've seen their houses being built right through to the end, they're diligent builders, there's nothing we read in the text that one wasn't diligent and one was, they both completed their houses, maybe the houses looked pretty much the same, built with similar materials, we don't read that there was anything wrong with the materials with which they built their house, on the surface, They're building a house, both of them, and they look the same. Number two, both builders are building upon some foundation. Everybody builds their life on something. Nobody builds their life on nothing. The question is whether that something is good and gonna last the storm or whether that something is bad and is gonna crash. It's impossible to build your life on nothing. Everyone has a worldview. And a worldview is really like spectacles. It's kind of like lenses with which you view your world. And we all have that. That's, that's why there's, there's challenges in our country because we all view situations through different lenses. Our history, our past, our privilege, our, our disadvantage, and, and that affects how we view the world. But, but also philosophically, there are so many isms and ideologies and presuppositions which you don't even test anymore, your foundations which are there but you don't see them and, and that's the way you react to the world. James Anderson says, worldviews play a central and defining role in our lives. They shape what we believe and what we're willing to believe, how we interpret our experiences, how we behave in response to those experiences, how we relate to others. Our thoughts and actions are conditioned by our worldviews. This is the incredible thing. You may not have ever thought about your worldview. You may have never thought about what your presuppositions and foundations are, but the way you act, the decisions you make, the choices you make, the way you parent, the way you do all sorts of things in life is affected by your worldview. And I think every person builds their lives on the answer to these five questions. And there's probably others, but these are the ones that I like, and I think they cover everything. Whether you've consciously thought about it or not, every person on the planet has an answer to these questions. Here here they are. How do we get here? Who am I? What is wrong with the world? What is the solution? And where are we going? How do we get here? We might say God. Other people say random. Maybe uh, I know some people who say aliens seeded the planet. If you believe aliens (laughs) came and seeded this planet, you're going to have a view on, on, on life. Who am I? Am I created in the image of God? Does that mean that as human beings we are equal? Are we inherently good? Are we inherently bad? Are we just a bunch of atoms thrown together? Are we just no different from the animals? Your view is gonna affect how you react to life. What's wrong with the world? Is it because we've rebelled against God or is it just nothing is wrong with the world? Some religions say, no, no, evil and pain and suffering is just an illusion of your mind and you just gotta kind of think yourself positive. What's wrong with the world? Is it lack of self-expression? That's what, you're suppressing stuff, you're suppressing you know, your sex drive, just kind of live it out, you're just an animal, just be whoever you wanna be. Too many rules, lack of money, or what's the solution? Is it education, is it sexual freedom, is it self-expression, is it charity, or is it Christ? Where are we going? Are we going nowhere? Do we just rot in the grave? Who knows? Is it heaven? Is it hell? Is it reincarnation? Is it nirvana? Every person has answered these questions whether they've thought about it or not. Atheists, postmodernists, animists, pantheists, everyone has a worldview. And what's incredible is that Jesus' parable confronts every builder and every foundation, and he puts the entire world into two categories. And this is where it starts to get hectic. Jesus says there are only two types of builders, only two types of foundations, only two ways to build, and only one foundation, the foundation built on him. How exclusive and narrow does that sound? Only the foundation built on him will survive the storm. All the other ideologies and isms he lumps into one category and says when the storm comes, they will not be sufficient to save. So both builders are building a house, they're both building on some foundation, and number three, Both builders experience the same storm. You might have thought as a Christian, you got some special treatment that that you're not gonna endure the storm, but both builders face the same fury of the same storm. And when the weather's fine and there's no clouds in the sky and you're looking around, both houses look fine. Both houses look secure. The foundations haven't been tested yet, so why should you bother building on the rock? Sand seems as viable as rock. And you look at it and you say, well, Here's the sand, here's the rock, I'm not gonna climb up the hill, what difference does it make? It hasn't been tested yet, that's the problem. 
And so as each builder stands back and admires his home, you can't see the immediate consequences of those foundations, because foundations are generally hidden. Everything looks fine until the storm hits. I think back of a complex near my house. It's less than a K from my house. It's in Reuter Avenue in Valtafreden Park. It's a complex that was called El Dorado, which in the Spanish was the city of gold. And I imagine the people buying off plan in this complex, and this complex was going to be their dream home. Maybe some of them invested their life savings. And within the first few years, that whole place had started to sink. I was on the little local uh, committee to the, on, on the ward council to government at that time. I served for five years, and that was one of the first things we had to deal with. What do we do with this complex in the area that's sinking? The developer knew that it was just a landfill. There was no, nothing firm there, and he decided to build, and then he disappeared. And within two years, with the rain coming, everything started to fall apart with massive cracks, and they had to declare the whole place unsafe, and everybody had to move out, and all of those homes are just demolished. That was like 2003. You can drive past Reuter Avenue and the walls are broken down. The place is still the mess that it was and it's been there for like, what, 15, 16 years. Earl F. Palmer says, there is a testing of all the houses we're building. And the testing is built into the whole plan. No favorites are excused from the inevitable testing of the value systems and philosophies of life and dreams into which we invest our lives. The storm tests the quality of each home. And that's why I often tell people, you have to build your foundational convictions before the storm comes. Because when the storm comes, it's too late. What do you believe about the big questions of life? What is your theology of suffering? I tell young people, you can't wait until you're about to get into a relationship to decide, well, should I date a non-Christian or shouldn't I? Should I have sex before marriage? You can't wait until suffering comes to figure out what do you believe about God? Is he sovereign? In the good times, you have to to drill down deep and you have to put down a foundation. I know that God loves me so that when the storm hits, your convictions can carry you through the storm. Trials and temptations and suffering have a way of revealing the cracks in our foundations. And, and, And my prayer is that should some kind of crisis or trauma or tragedy strike, that we would be ready. And sadly, How many fall away at the first knock, first hard knock that that pokes their bubble and and, and reveals that maybe their theology wasn't a theology built on the rock. It was built on hype or emotionalism or something else. Think about what the storm could be. It could be a boyfriend. It could be alcohol. It could be doubts that come. It could be affluence just worldly materialism, it could be illness, it could be growing old, and you suddenly realize, hey, I've, I've lived in this good weather, and now in, in my declining years, man, now it's testing my faith. Erosion always starts slow, but erosion, as it begins to happen, at least it can be a blessing because it begins to uncover your foundation, and if you're this side of eternity, you can still come and trust Christ afresh. I want to encourage you, if you've got doubts, ask those questions. Don't suppress those doubts. Doubt's not the same as unbelief. Doubt is there to cause you to say, hey, I've got these doubts, but yes, I'm standing firmly on the rock. And I think too many churches just don't deal with doubts. And I think of a mother that once brought her son to me who had all these doubts, and she just said, you need to fix him. And I said, well, what's your problem? And he said, I don't believe God exists. I said, well, what have you told him? I just told him he must just believe. I said, well, do you believe? Yeah, I think so. I don't really know, but you just better believe. And we have to face these realities, these storms, and they come to test our faith so that our faith would be proved genuine. But in the context of our parable, I believe that the storm that Jesus is primarily speaking about is not just the storms of life but I think it's the ultimate storm of final judgment. When all that we have done will be exposed and put before God's holiness. In the searching gaze of his holy judgment, he will evaluate everything with absolute clarity and truth. We cannot pull the wool over God's eyes. And Paul writes even to believers in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, Each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. 
Friends, it's sobering. If you are someone this morning who has not put your faith and trust in Christ, then it is only by God's grace and his patience that he has not come in wrath. And God's wrath is a thing that we don't often talk about in church, but it is like a a, a damn wall that is about to break upon sinners and we need to take God's wrath seriously because who can stand unless you have some covering, some mediator, somebody to plead your cause and none of us are immune from God's searching judgment. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we read these scary words of those who had no solid foundation in Christ. In Revelation 6.16, we read, They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Only Christ is the solid rock. Only he is the one you must cling to. Stand on him, build your life on him. We sing that song, I will build my life upon your love. Let Christ endure the storm of judgment. When he hung upon the cross, that's what he was doing. He was the lightning rod absorbing the wrath of God in himself. And if you say, Lord Jesus, may your death be mine, then this grand exchange takes place and his grace and his mercy will cover you. You'll be clothed in his righteousness and he will have absorbed that wrath as your substitute. Well, are you ready for the fourth similarity between the two builders? They're both building a house. They're both building on some foundation and both experience the storm. But here's the shocker. And remember, the parables all have a shock to them. Number four, both builders are hearers of God's word. Just let that sink in for a moment. This sobered me. The wise and the foolish builders both claim to be Christians. Who's Jesus' audience? It is the listeners of the Sermon on the Mount. It's people who are enjoying the sermon. They love preaching. They're people who are in church every week. Jesus isn't drawing a contrast between atheists and Christians and saying, right, I wanna give a message to you guys here about the bad guys out there. He's drawing a distinction between those who are true believers and those who are counterfeit, similar to the parable of the 10 virgins. Just look at the context. If you've still got your Bibles open, chapter seven from verse 15, look at the context. You'll know a good tree by its good fruit and and you'll be able to recognize true and false prophets and then those sobering words just before this parable, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of this stuff in your name? And he says, I didn't know you. So this parable in its context is about false and true foundations and that they look similar. John Stott, the famous commentator, says both are members of the visible Christian community. Both read the Bible, go to church, listen to sermons and buy Christian literature. We could say both of them take notes. Both of them are moved and energized. Both of them hear the same sermon. Both of them admire Jesus' teaching. Nobody neglected or rejected his teaching. They all seem to be interested. Both could be in this auditorium this morning hearing the same sermon. So how can you discern the difference between true and false builders? Well, we have to look a little bit beneath the surface and we have to expose the foundation and we'll see that one is wise and one is foolish because of the foundation. So I've put up the slide. Here's just a summary of all the differences and I'm I'm just gonna kind of deal with them in lump sum, but there's a difference between the builders, wise versus foolish. There's a difference in the foundations, rock versus sand. There's a difference in the outcome, stands firm versus falls, and a difference in how they applied God's word. One obeyed it and one didn't. So let's look at the wise builder. He built his house on the rock. And how did he do that? Look at verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built on his house on the rock. And what happened? We read in verse 25, when the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And what of the foolish builder? He built his house on the sand and how did he do that? Jesus tells us in verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And what happened to that house? The same storm, the rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, the beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. So the difference is obedience. The wise man hears and obeys, and the foolish man, he hears, it goes in one ear, and by Sunday lunch, it's already gone out the other ear, and certainly by Monday morning, the pressures of life, there's not much obedience happening. This is the punchline. This is the punchline. If you are only hearing truth, 
you are not prepared for the storm. That's challenging. If you're only hearing truth or reading truth, you're not prepared for the storm. Just listening to truth can delude you into a false sense of security. Hearing God's word is not enough. You have to obey it. A friend can tell you all day that a particular chair can hold you. And it's probably a bad example because some of these chairs have been breaking and we need to replace some of them. And chair number three over there, Mike Combrink learned his lesson. That's why he's sitting in row number two. Chair number two, got maybe a 60% chance there. So maybe my analogy is going to break down. But if I convince you that a chair can hold you, you can believe that intellectually as long as you like. But you have not exercised true faith until you take your legs off the ground and you entrust yourself to that chair. You can get all emotional about, oh, I love chairs, that's such a beautiful chair, wonderful color, look what you can do on the chair, amazing tricks and moves, means nothing until you sit in that chair. That's why on honeymoon I was a chicken, I remember it. I wanted to go bungee jumping and I would plucked up all the courage and as I stood there I could have told you the science behind it, I could have told you the research I'd done, I could have interviewed all the people that bungee jumped, but I chickened out. I chickened out, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't bring myself. I just made the excuse, well, it's too expensive. That was, that was my solution to, to recover myself that early into marriage. <clears throat> and um, hopefully Liesl's forgotten about that. But true faith has an intellectual component, but it's not just intellectual. Even the demons have that. It's not, it has an emotional component. You've got to love that truth. You've got to be drawn towards it, but ultimately you have to act on it. And if you don't act on it, you don't have true faith. So you can be as intellectual as you like, you can, you can be as emotional as you like, you can be jumping up and down in worship, or you can even just be a doer. Some churches are just do, 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 social help and all that, but any one of those things, divorced from the others, is not a true faith. If you're not trusting Christ to save you, if you've not really responded to the gospel and actually entrusted yourself to Christ, then all other ground is sinking sand. An old pastor, his name was Gardner Spring, said there is a hope that is as an anchor to the soul and there is a hope that is as the spider's web. Do you want an anchor for your soul or do you want to trust the spider's web for judgment day? And he says, the former is built on the rock of ages, the latter on the sand. And that's the challenge for us. We live in an information overload age. We love new stuff and little bite-sized things. We only read short blogs and little uh, sound bites here and there. We don't always think about, okay, how do I apply this? We've just got so much stuff and we know, ach, if I need that information, it's at my disposal. I mean, think how many versions of the Bible you can access on your phone, how many apps there are, how many podcasts. We've got right now media with 20,000 Bible studies. How do you even watch all of that? If you were to add up, how many hours you have sat in church and listened sermons for, particularly if you're 60 years old and you've been in church most of your life. How many hours is that? How many hours in Bible study? But is there a direct proportion between the stuff that you know and what you've worked into your life? That's a challenge. Our heads are stuffed with knowledge, but what of our gossip, our relationships, our work ethic, our evangelism, our worry, our prayer lives, our lusts, our spending habits, our racism, our laziness, our self-discipline? In an age of passive entertainment, we're used to just being entertained, and sometimes we can think preaching is that I can just kind of come and park off and somehow it'll come into me, a kind of a Netflix culture. But obedience sticks out like a sore thumb because you have to get off the couch, you have to do something, there's effort required. And God works his grace in us and obedience is the fruit. It's the fruit. If there's no fruit, then we have to question the reality. To listen to God's word with no plan to act on it is to miss everything that Christ is saying. James says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You see, that's the danger. I've listened to a great sermon And so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. Imagine that, looking at your face in the mirror, me getting up for work and saying, oh, but I've got breakfast on the side here and I've got a pimple over here and I'm just looking like I've really been battered from the weekend and that's how I go off to work. And some of you look like that at work. I know that. I mean, you need to call a staff meeting actually maybe this week. Where's where's Ryan, hey? (laughs) Hey, sometimes you look okay, hey? <laughs> but James says, and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He doesn't do anything with what he's seen in the mirror of God's word. 
But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So can I give you maybe five practical aids to help you obey? And um, I remember probably 25 years ago reading a book called How to Listen to a Sermon. And at the time, the author had gone to every library he could find to see if there were any books about how to effectively listen. And he said he couldn't find a single book written in history about how to be an effective listener. That's quite a radical challenge. Thankfully, there's been a lot of books that have come out since then. But here's five aids to help you not just to listen, but to listen to obey. Number one, and you might find these helpful, prepare your heart to listen to obey. And how could you prepare your heart? One of the ways as you come here is to really pray for your soul, and I know some of you do that, but pray for yourself. Lord, won't you speak to me this morning? Lord, won't you open my heart? Won't you make me receptive to what you wanna say to me? How else can you prepare your heart? Get enough sleep. If you've been parting till who knows what time on a Saturday night, that's gonna affect your ability to listen. Come early. Think about how much stress is involved in finding a parking, getting the kids to KBA, sorting out stuff. No wonder there might be conflict as you make your way here. That's gonna affect your ability to listen. And then come eager. Say, Lord, I'm expecting you to speak. Lord, I'm coming hungry. Won't you fill me? Lord, speak to me today. And if you come with that expectancy, don't be surprised if God rocks up in that sense. And then number two, I wanna suggest that maybe you only take application notes. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking detailed notes of the sermon, but we all know we've got bookshelves filled with books from conferences and lever arch files and stuff that we've, that we've done over the years, and it's on a shelf. Why don't you come and use your phone or whatever it is that you wanna use, paper, and just say, Lord, what is the one thing that you want me to do? What is the one application, the takeaway? What is the thing that I need to change in my life by your grace? The so what? So what? Number three, create an action plan of what your obedience will look like. It's not gonna happen by osmosis. What's your plan for this week? What do, maybe you need some think time to say, Lord, how am I gonna really apply this? What is it that needs to change? What are the, the, the ways that I've been behaving that, that need to change? And what will that look like this week and this month and this year? And who is it that I'm gonna share my faith with? And who is it that I'm praying? And Lord, there's the name and this is what I'm gonna do. And then number four, talk about it. Maybe ask somebody to hold you accountable. I had a mentor who said to me, learn it, do it, talk about it. And we often learn it and then we just talk about it and we don't do anything. He said, learn it, do it, and then you'll have so much to talk about. It's in the doing that we actually realize that's what true hearing is. We haven't truly heard until we've done it. And there's something amazing when we apply God's word and we begin to do it. It's like, ah, now I think I've heard what God was saying. And number five, you have to come back and evaluate your progress and obedience. It's not gonna happen by accident. What is it that you're setting as a goal in 2020 in your spiritual life by God's grace? You see, I don't think we always actively choose to disobey. No one wakes up and says, I'm gonna be disobedient. Disobedience is often just an apathy that does nothing. And I think it was the same for the foolish man in the story. I don't think he was intentionally, deliberately building on the sand. It's just that he was careless, he, he took shortcuts, he wasn't intentionally saying, I should really be thinking about whether this is a strong foundation. What do I need to build on a solid foundation? Maybe these are some of the things he said to himself. You know, I don't see a storm coming. I mean, look at the view of this place. I mean, to be right here on the water's edge by the river, I mean, this is an amazing location. I mean, who wants to lug all this building material up the hill onto this rock? And I mean, the, the, the soil is soft here, I can compact it nicely. Who wants to get the jackhammer up on that massive rock and try and you know, build things up there? And so he just took things easy. Maybe he thought to himself, you know, I've still got time to get ready. I mean, uh, there hasn't rained here for years. I mean, if this river does start to flood, I'm gonna have a little bit of time, then I can move uphill, uh, you know, and maybe some of you are saying, well, I, I just wanna live my life now, and, and when I'm older, that's when I'll get serious with God. You know, I'm a young person now, I mean, I've got my friends, I've got my partying, I've got my lifestyle. When I get older, I'll settle down. Maybe when I'm married, then I can get serious because I'll have kids and all that, but for now, I'm just comfortable being a hearer of God's word. Or maybe he said, you know, building on a rock is a little bit narrow for my liking. I mean, there's lots of different ways to build. I mean, it's a little bit arrogant to say that there's only one way to build and it should be on a rock and that's a strong foundation. I mean, look at the houses, nothing's happened. Both look fine to me. And I think that's really the key to this parable. 
Is Jesus your authority or is something else your authority? To fail to obey Jesus is to admit that something else is your authority. I am my authority. My fears are my authority. My friends are my authority. My comforts are my authority. And Jesus is saying something radical here. He is saying that he is the authoritative one. That's how come you can give this parable. And so it's actually quite radical. When you choose to obey Christ, in that moment, you're actually worshiping him. You're saying, Lord, my obedience is not just something I need to do. I'm actually worshiping and honoring your authority and lordship over my life. And Jesus is making one of the most staggering claims here. Maybe you've missed it about his divine authority. This is radical Christianity. Do you know why I say that? Every other rabbi of the day would have never spoken the way Jesus spoke. They would have referred to what other rabbis had gone before said in Clause 3.2, and they would have referred back to other authorities outside of themselves. When Deuteronomy comes to an end, that's the end of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the law. I think it's around about Deuteronomy 31. It says, if you obey the words of the law, blessing will come, and if you do not obey the words of the first five books of the Bible, curses will come. You know what Jesus does? He says, if you don't obey me and my words and my teaching and this sermon, you will not survive the storm. He is putting himself in the place of the entire Old Testament law. He's making a radical claim. And either you've got to say he's a madman or you've got to say he's telling the truth and he's worthy of my worship. Do you take Jesus at his word? If you say that somebody is an authority in your life, then you trust them. If some big shot heart surgeon who's got a great reputation says, you need to come for heart surgery on Wednesday morning, you're gonna go. If the IT guru at work is, is says to you, this is what you need to do to fix your broken USB port, you're gonna listen because you trust him because he's an authority. So why, if Christ is our authority and we claim to love him, are we not more determined to say, Lord, I long to obey you, to listen to you, to trust you? Douglas O'Donnell says, If Jesus is the unique son of God who created and sustains the universe, who came to earth as a man who performed miracles, especially rising from the dead, and if what he taught and did was predicted by the prophets and attested to by apostolic eyewitnesses, then what he says about entrance into the kingdom of heaven is trustworthy. Jesus claims that human wisdom and human folly will be assessed based on one's reception or rejection of the sermon on the the mount. What a staggering claim. What a staggering claim. I don't know if you've been following just the Christian media of late, but over the past month or so, two prominent Christian leaders that I've followed and I've admired have gone onto social media and have posted that they are abandoning the faith. Joshua Harris is the former senior pastor of Covenant Life Church, Sovereign Grace Ministries is part of that. We sing some of their songs. Uh, C.J. Mahaney was the senior pastor there. And um, Joshua Harris is also a famous Christian author who taught a generation of young people about dating and about marriage. And he announced, probably just over a month ago, that he's divorcing his wife and abandoning Christ. This is what he posted. And it's got a picture of him looking out on this beautiful vista, blue water, and these mountains in the background somewhere in the US, as though this is just such a a beautiful picture of this move forward. And and this saddens me. He says, I've undergone a massive shift. You see, we're talking foundational language. I've undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. (laughs) By all the measurements I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. To my Christian friends, I can't join you in your mourning. I don't view this moment negatively. I feel very much alive and awake and surprisingly hopeful. I believe that all shall be well. That's a challenge. I want to encourage you to pray for Joshua Harris. Pray for his church. Those that have sat under his preaching for probably two decades. And yeah, he's walking away from all of it. Marty Sampson, a worship leader from Hillsong. He's written worship songs for more than two decades. We sing many of his songs here. And he wrote last week online, I'm genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. Let the rain fall, the sun will come up tomorrow. I mean, in the light of this text, that's sobering. There's dangers there. And he lists a whole lot of doubts and questions that he has, which he says that no one in the church talks about 
And in some sense, and I don't wanna be judgmental of Hillsong, I think it's an indictment that he's saying his church has never addressed these issues. And it seems like for the first time, and some of the questions he's asking are the most fundamental things around suffering and around science and religion and whether miracles don't happen and, and, and things he's been confronted with. And he's now saying the church doesn't talk about this. And now for the first time, the storm is blowing in his life and the foundations are crumbling. Jesus' height must not be confused with Jesus' depth. And our text tells us that the foolish man does have a foundation. It's just that it isn't Jesus. It's the opinions of people. It's merely one's inner voice. And the scriptures teach us we're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by our performance. But they are the result of knowing Christ. They are the evidence. They are the fruit. And if there's no fruit, we have to come back. But even as we come back, I'm reminded of this beautiful handwritten note. This lady had passed away from a long a bout of cancer, and I read this story, this little handwritten note was found hidden, tucked away in her Bible. And this is what she wrote. She said, often on the rock I tremble, faint of heart and weak of knee, but the steadfast rock of ages never trembles under me. And so when those doubts come and those storms come, yeah, you're gonna have doubts. Maybe there are times where you do question your salvation because you say, Lord, where even is my obedience? But then you recognize, Lord, I am sure I am clinging to you. And Lord, yes, my, my knees are weak and I, I'm fainting, I'm trembling, but I'm just so grateful, Lord, that I'm standing on a rock that never trembles under me. There's great comfort in that. But as we close, there's a great promise of hope in this parable. And I wanna leave you with this promise of hope. And that is that if you are building your life on Christ, then every prayer you've prayed, every small deed of kindness you've done, every hand you've fed, that's gonna echo into eternity. What you've done for Christ will last. It'll last forever. Even as a church, what we do, if we build our lives on Christ's word and the word of God, it will be of lasting eternal value. It will bear fruit. The people that you are praying for and sharing with, even if there seems to be no response, God is at work and it'll echo into eternity. Here's the words of C.T. Studd, a famous missionary. These words were impacted my life at the end of high school and were part of some of the reason of God calling me into ministry. This is what C.T. Studd wrote in this poem. Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I remember thinking, Lord, I want my life to come. I want a life that echoes into eternity, Lord. And so I decided, and that was God's call for me, is that I want to give all of my time and all of my resources to serve God full time. There's a subtle play on words in the Greek as I wrap things up, and I thought, do I share this with you or not? Is this kind of, as I said once before, letting you into the kitchen? But let me let you into the kitchen here because this is so beautiful. And our English translations don't pick up on this. There are two Greek words for beating against. When it talks about the storm beating against, in verse 25, the house that's on the rock, and the Greek beating against the house that's on the sand, the English doesn't have any way to translate this. So it just says beating against. But there's a subtle difference, even though the words are similar. The first beat against means to fall in homage. And the second beat against means to, to trip or to stumble. And Craig Blomberg helped me to see this. He says, in other words, The storm has to bow in surrender or fall in homage to the house built on the rock because it cannot even move it while even a slight stumble on the part of the storm, the storm just has to go like that and the house on the sand collapses. And so because the wise builder has constructed his life on Christ by trusting him, no amount of testing, no amount of difficulty can bring him down. And if your foundation is in Christ, then take hope in this. This is the promise. Let the wind howl at you. Let suffering come and unleash its fury on your life. Let Satan come and accuse you whatever he wants to accuse you. Let judgment come. Cling only to Christ. Trust only Christ. And the storm will be forced to bow down in homage to the rock of ages on which you stand. And then you too will be able to echo these bold lyrics from a band that I love called Switchfoot. It's a song called Hello Hurricane. And I love the bold arrogance of trusting Christ that comes through in this song. This is what they say. I've been watching the skies. They've been turning blood red. Not a doubt in my mind anymore. There's a storm up ahead. Hello, hurricane. You're not enough. Hello, hurricane. You can't silence my love. 
I've got doors and windows boarded up. All your dead-end fury is not enough. You can't silence my love. Everything I have, I count as loss. Everything I have is stripped away. Before I started building, I counted up these costs. There's nothing left for you to take away. Hello, hurricane, you're not enough. Hello, hurricane, you can't silence my love. I've got doors and windows boarded up. All your dead-end fury is not enough. You can't silence my love. So, as we close, what did Jesus hear us think of this message at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, having just heard this parable? Were they moved? Were they moved to obey? Well, let's look. If you've still got your text open, the last two verses, verse 28 and 29, we don't know. Because all we read is when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. But did they go out and obey? We don't know. And so perhaps as we come to the end of our parable series, having been challenged and hearing Christ's words from his very own lips, perhaps Jesus would say to us today what he said to those first disciples from John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, we stand again in need of your grace. None of us can obey you apart from grace. Lord, we can try and obey you in our own strength. But Lord, we know that obedience done apart from you can accomplish nothing. But Lord, at the same time, we don't want to underestimate obedience and just say, oh, we need to just let go and let God. You've called us to respond to your word, to live changed lives, to look, to look differently from the world. And Lord, sadly, our lives often look identical to houses that are built on the sand, and yet we claim to be on the rock. So Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to build on you, that as the small storms of life come, there'd be evidence that we have an anchor, an anchor for the soul, that we're not trusting a spider's web, Lord, that you would help us to be rooted in you. You, Lord Jesus, are the rock. You're the shield, you're the foundation. Lord, I pray that you would convict us so that we'd be moved to action, that your Holy Spirit would energize us afresh, Lord, that our obedience, as you've said, your yoke is easy and your burden is light, and yet, Lord, often it feels like the opposite. So I just pray, Lord, that you'd give us renewed resolve to live different lives, Lord, that we would not just come Sunday in and Sunday out and not be changed, that we'd go from year to year and just allow the winds of life to blow us wherever, Lord. May we be those that are rooted and those that are different. Help us, we pray, Lord, whatever it is that we are facing at the moment, whether it is unemployment, whether it is illness, whether it is sexual temptation, Lord, whether it is financial worries, whether it is our relationships, whether it is problems with our children or with our parents, whether it's fears and uncertainties, Lord, whatever those storms are, I pray that you would help us to recognize that those hurricanes cannot do anything to us because we stand secure in Christ. May it be to you and to you alone that we look for all that we need for life and for godliness because we pray this in your name. Amen.